Um, can everyone see my screen and hear me? We are good. All right, looks good. So we will begin. Okay, so hi. My name is Anirudh Bunsel, and I'm just going to start us off with a brief introduction by defining these two terms, deep learning and computational biology. So deep learning is the training of networks to learn relationships from a prior data set to make accurate predictions about new data points that are introduced. And computational biology is the application of different types of modeling techniques to study biological systems. So starting off with application one, it's actually a research study I was involved with for the past couple of years. Um, it's called Modeling Fitness of Unregulated RAS Mutants Using Computational Mutagenesis and Machine Learning. So it sounds like a mouthful of like a lot of fancy words that some of you guys might be unfamiliar with. So we're going to break it down kind of into simpler terms and just walk through the research. So starting off with RAS proteins, as you uh, must have learned in like your life sciences classes, proteins are a big group of kind of biological bodies. And so RAS proteins specifically in the human body are responsible for cell growth and exist in two functional states on and off. And so these are regulatory states. And as with any protein, they're made up of several amino acids in a chain, which are then folded into a complex structure. And so the case for RAS is that it has 166 amino acids and at each of these points, mutations can occur um, when uh, the replication process and such occurs. And so mutations to RAS in particular, leave it in a permanently on state, which is um, uh, kind of like specifically bad because this can lead to tumor growth and cancer development. Since uh, RAS proteins are a form of proto-oncogenes, a specific subclass of proteins that are uh, kind of related to cancer. And so, um, in fact, 30% of all human cancers link to these mutated RAS proteins. And worse yet, 95% of pancreatic cancer is linked to this. And pancreatic cancer is especially one of the worst kinds of cancer, uh, symptomatically. So kind of the way this research study has worked is there was research in general, kind of as you'll see as a common theme throughout this presentation, is that research in general in any field really just builds off of each other over time, especially in computational biology, which in the past 15 years has seen like an explosion of data ever since the human genome was mapped about 15, 20 years ago. And so specifically a couple of years ago, a recent study experimentally determined functional changes, also known as fit values of these mutations to RAS. So kind of like one of the central dogmas of um, protein biology is that structure determines function. You know, the way a protein is structured greatly affects, you know, its actual specific functional capabilities. And this is kind of like the backbone of a lot of biology because proteins, um, you know, have a lot of complex functions, which are essential in the human body. So essentially with RAS, these researchers looked at all the different single point mutations of RAS, of which there are 3,135, and then they determined their fitness values experimentally, meaning in a lab. So the way they did this was with a technique known as saturation mutagenesis. And although this is an accurate method and you know um, yields great results, it is complicated and expensive and time consuming. And so in this study, with the use of computational biology techniques, we sought to develop a computational method so that this could be all kind of automated for future studies. And we can look at not only RAS, but also all other types of proteins that are linked to cancer and other types of diseases, including perhaps neurodegenerative diseases, et cetera, and really run the gamut of different uh, biological diseases by having a computational model uh, analyze all of these mutations. And so we developed a novel approach that utilized you know, computational mutagenesis and machine learning, which are two of the key terms in the title of this um, application that I mentioned to predict the functional effects of these mutations to the RAS protein. So, um, I mean, I can slow down for questions towards the end of, the, of each application perhaps, but for now I'm gonna keep going. Hopefully, um, like kind of, we've defined a lot of the basic terms before we get into some of the like methodologies and results of the studies. So, um, computational mutagenesis specifically, Essentially, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds here, but the general big picture is we talked about saturation mutagenesis as the experimental technique to kind of um, determine and quantify the structural changes 
occurring to each um, of the mutated proteins for RAS. So computational mutagenesis is just doing this computationally. And the way it's doing it is, you know, to transfer some like complex biological process, uh, process to um, a computational one, you need to assign some quantitative measures. So in this case, these quantitative measures are known as like energy scores or residual scores. So I'll get into what those mean um, a bit later. But essentially what is done um, is kind of building off again on prior research in the field of, you know, of, of kind of protein mutagenesis. Uh, researchers have determined energy stability scores of different mutations that are occurring to this protein, right? And even across other proteins. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at each of these 3000 plus mutations and looking at each of um, kind of assigning their energy scores to them so that, that we can uh, process all of this data computationally. And then where the idea is if we load up all of this data about the structure for the protein into a computer, since you know structure determines function, we can then uh, develop some type of model, specifically machine learning models to predict the functional effects of the proteins. I hope kind of that um, is a bit simpler to understand. So now about the actual machine learning part, again, we're just mapping, if you look at the figure on the right, all this data that's incoming, we're developing an algorithm, you know, the common machine learning, uh, commonly used machine learning algorithms and the output in our case is the functional effects. And so the reason this is key to know the output is if we know the functional you know, effects or fitness values, of these mutations, then we know which of these mutations are going to lead to cancer or not, which are um, carcinogenic. So this is a basic kind of workflow diagram of the data in this study. It looks fairly complicated, but it's actually not, um, not that much. It kind of simplifies what we're actually doing. If you look at uh, figure A, that's essentially what's known as the ribbon diagram of the protein. It might look like what the protein uh, looks like in the human body, for example, of RAS in particular. And so again, researchers in the past have determined this complex 3D structure, and they've kind of uh, uploaded these structures to an online open access database. So we called the information from there. And then in B, we're identifying each of the 166 amino acids in this RAS protein and we're also connecting the ones that are closely associated, you know, the ones that are close to each other in the folded structure, their neighboring amino acid residues, so to speak. And so once we have this map and see of all these connected, um, you know, amino acids, we know which ones are kind of related to others in the stability of the whole structure. And so now when a mutation occurs in part D, for example, you know, which are the neighboring amino acids that are affected. And so having all of the structural information being loaded into the computer is key for the model, uh, kind of figuring out any patterns and making future predictions in the data for the functional effects. So again, I'm not going to get super into the weeds here, but with computational mutagenesis, we're assigning these residual scores to each of the amino acid residues in the structure. And so then the collection of all 166 such scores is known as the residual profile vector. So the way we load into a computer in kind of an efficient manner is we just uh, input this whole vector of all these scores for each of the amino acids. So you can imagine it's a lot of data because we have 166 data points of scores for each of the 3,135 mutations. So it adds up to be you know, thousands of data points. And so this is just kind of some of the mathematical underpinnings for why some of this work. Um, essentially, it's backed by like probability distributions and all, uh, both in nature and um, that we find, you know, researchers have studied previous proteins before in nature, and then also mathematically um, what's expected based on the probability of certain groups of amino acids interacting with each other. And so again, this is an essential a determination for these specific residual scores. This is essentially how they're derived. And once we have this information, um, this also really aids in predictive power for the models. So now we're just gonna get, get, get into the um, kind of some data figures that illustrate some of the relationships in the model. And so, in this figure, I'm not going to explain each of them, but it just kind of uh, validates the relationship of what we're trying to do here. Essentially, we know the structure determines uh, function and proteins, but what we're trying to do here is demonstrate that our data is accurate and reliable, because if we can kind of show the structure determines function with our data itself, then we know that like it's showing the same relationship as what holds in nature. And therefore, you know, we can progress with our machine learning models and our whole experiment and know that's kind of sound. So um, this is, again, just a workflow diagram. A lot of research studies will use things like this to simplify the structure. And 
uh, what's done here is a lot of this obtained data is being inputted, and then there's different types of models that are built, machine learning models. There's models known as random forest, there's models known as rep tree regression, and then we're doing data analysis, just kind of like I showed and we'll continue to show in a bit, and then uh, we kind of compare the accuracy of our different models and results. So this is a table, for example, in a lot of these research studies, including um, this particular study I was working on, uh, showing a comparison of different machine learning models based on different error metrics and accuracy uh, percentages. And this is a graphical representation. It's more than just a pretty diagram, of course. It kind of shows all the different 3,000 plus mutations along with each of the different amino acid residues. Because as you might have learned in your life sciences classes, you know, there's 20 types of amino acid residues. They're represented by different letters from A through Z. Obviously, um, not all of them. Are, and some of them are left out. And so as you can see on the left-hand side, those are all the different types of amino acids. Along the top half and the bottom half are the different positions, um, you know, the different 166 amino acid residue positions. And then this is essentially a huge data matrix of um, where green represents that the model predicted this particular mutation correctly, and red represents that it didn't. And so we can see kind of further do some work and look at the clusters of red and see what, maybe why the model didn't perform, uh, perform as expected in these areas and improve the models over time. So this is just another table comparing kind of the accuracy of our model at the very top to those of other computational models uh, previously done you know, in the field. And so fortunately, this one performed a bit better on um, this particular machine learning approach along with the data that we are provided with um, in the lab. And so this is again, just showing some training occurring during the models. Um, this is just showing some error. So I'm just trying to um, kind of give you guys a taste of maybe what different types of figures in research studies look like and what types of things researchers are looking at. Uh, Cause later we'll talk about like less research oriented um, applications of computational biology and machine learning. So we're just trying to give you an idea about this first. So again, this is like a scatter plot showing um, maybe regression, the predicted versus the expected values for functional changes of the model. As you can see, overall the models have been performing quite well. We'll get into like kind of what this means and bigger implications in a moment. This is kind of a, a training set because what happens is when we have all this data, we have to feed it into a computer slowly. We can't do it all at once. So the model can slowly learn. So we do it in batches of data. And so this is showing how as each successive batch is fed in and the model is kind of learning the different patterns using these machine learning algorithms, um, the accuracy is improving bit by bit and the performance is overall increasing. So now getting into some bigger uh, ideas about and takeaways about this research study. The models perform quite well in this particular approach, um, which is a computational one, is a bit novel in this, in this particular application, which had been traditionally performed experimentally or without machine learning approaches and thus weren't as robust. And so uh, it allowed for for a pretty inexpensive technique, it's completely free. We use all open source you know, data as opposed to like the time consuming and expensive process in the lab. So it shows a lot of promise for looking at other types of proteins. And in fact, we're continuing to look at a lot of other proteins that are linked um, to cancer, different types of cancer, including breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and looking at their data uh, using the same approach and uncovering a lot of different new mutations that, are, um, that can then inform a lot of clinical decisions because we can discover new mutations that are carcinogenic uh, like and that are cancer causing that were not known before and so then this is key because now if a patient comes in with like a new mutation we know its status whereas before we may not have so this is kind of what this slide is reiterating um, just that the discovery and kind of contribution to new, new knowledge through research studies like this and there's a lot of these happening these days in computational biology of course and so then getting to broader clinical applications um, this can have a lot of uh, profound effects for diagnostic and treatment modalities, which essentially means that once we know of these, you know, the first step is to know that certain mutations exist so that you can identify them in a patient. Then the second step is now, okay, you know that they exist. Now you can work closely with pharmaceutical companies and other research teams to develop drugs that are effective and effective diagnostic and treatment tests, you know, to, um, that are tailored towards specific patients to detect them. Um, and to detect whether they have a certain mutation and then to respond appropriately with an appropriate treatment. And also targeted therapy is a big um, kind of burgeoning area these days in terms of looking at personalized uh, genomes of patients and then de developing targeted solutions for each individual.
So again, there's a lot of areas of future work with this study, as with all computational biology studies, they all tend to build off of each other, um, just kind of the central principle of research. And so some of these that are mentioned are encompass them. So we're gonna take like, I guess like 30 second break or so and see if there's questions we can answer about this first application uh, before we move on to the next. Hi, Arnav. Uh, at the moment, we have no questions, so you're good to go. All right, sounds great. So that first um, kind of application was really research intensive, but now we're going to get into just some more conceptual things with application number two. Okay, hi, guys. Um, this is Anirudh again, and I'm going to be talking about our second application for today, predicting gene expression from a DNA sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna start us off with some background information about this topic. So as you guys have, may have learned before, DNA makes up the genetic code of all multicellular organisms uh, on our planet. And the central dogma of molecular biology is that DNA can be transcribed into an, an mRNA sequence. And then uh, once it's in that mRNA sequence, it can be translated into amino acids and uh, when several amino acids are linked together, they form a polypeptide chain or a protein. And then those proteins, they work, they function to uh, produce the phenotypes of an organism. And uh, a phenotype is basically what the, I guess you could think, the outward appearance of a certain trait is. For example, I have uh, brown hair. So um, my, my phenotype for hair color would be, would be brown. Uh, so gene expression, it's affected by several factors, not just the, the raw nucleotide sequence. And uh, nucleotides, by the way, are uh, the, the building blocks of a DNA sequence. So the different nucleotide bases are A, C, T, and G, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uh, thymine. And in MR, uh, one, so as you can see in the figure below at the bottom, uh, this is kind of a good summary of how the process I described before works. Uh, we start at the DNA sequence of A, C, T, and G, and then those that strand is transcripted, transcribed into the mRNA sequence. And the only difference between the two is that uh, there's no thymine in, uh, in mRNA sequences. They're replaced with uracil, which is represented by U. And again, from these mRNA sequences, uh, Basically, every set of three DNA nucleotide, mRNA nucleotides is, uh, is split up into what's called a codon. And these codons are essentially representative of an amino acid. And like I said before, amino acids go on to form proteins and the proteins, they work to produce the outward appearances of organisms. So uh, yeah, so like I was saying before, uh, gene expression is not just affected by nucleotide sequence. There are other factors at play, like listed here, histones, which are like the, which are the things that wrap a DNA sequence. And then there are other translational factors and then also environmental factors. For example, as you guys may know, uh, habits such as smoking, they can cause mutations, which are um, their replacements of their single point mutations, which was, which is like a replacement of a guanine G to a thymine, for example. And those can have dramatic effects depending on the scale of the mutation. And then another factor that can affect gene expression is uh, germline specific genes. Okay, so the problem with the problem that I'm going to describe today in application number two regards gene expression profiling. So Essentially, gene expression profiling is uh, taking the raw DNA sequence and predicting what the phenotype will be or what the gene will serve to do when it creates the different proteins from the sequence. So the problem today is that gene expression profiling is usually done in a lab setting. And the problem with this is that it's extremely expensive and uh, it's often complicated and difficult to actually carry out these experiments. Uh, so since they require so many resources, 
a more effective uh, a more effective opportunity for gene expression profiling is using computational biology and informatics to uh, to make it more scalable and cheaper to uh, to essentially predict gene expression from DNA sequences. And there are several applications of gene expression profiling. For example, uh, like single cell statuses can sometimes represent the health of the entire body, as in the case of cancer. Uh, they can, researchers can also, I mean, doctors can also diagnose genetic diseases from gene expression. And it's also possible to see the effectiveness of different drug treatments based on the response of cells. Okay, so for predicting gene expression from a DNA sequence, there are several computational methods that can be used. So we list two, uh, two of the primary methods that are used for this uh, research here. The first one is called XGBoost algorithm. And this is essentially a machine learning algorithm that utilizes a tree regression framework. And a tree regression framework is essentially a machine learning algorithm in which uh, certain data points are valued more than others. And those weightages and biases can affect the final output of the machine learning algorithm. So as you can see in the top right, uh, this image here, there are several data points, and this is what we call a decision tree. And at the very top of this tree, you can see the data point X1. And that, since it's at the very top of the data, at the, the very top of the tree, it would be weighted more than one of the bottom points like X3. And this can oftentimes help in creating a heuristic for the machine learning algorithm. A heuristic is basically in like, like a formula, so I could, a formula you could say, that, uh, that helps different differentiate different output. For example, if you're, uh, if you have several pictures of cats and dogs, then, and you want to classify them at each picture as a cat or a dog, then you'd essentially use a heuristic uh, that utilizes different features or factors, such as uh, whether they have whiskers, uh, just like different uh, parts of their faces, different features of their faces, right? So that's the first algorithm, XGBoost, which is a tree regression algorithm. And uh, I note here that they, the algorithm uses several methods to prevent overfitting. And overfitting is essentially an occurrence in machine learning when there are, when the model, uh, it trains the, like the model is trained so precisely on the few data points that it's given that it can't be scaled to other data points. For example, if you're given a test set of like 20 data points, but well, then you need to use that set of 20 data points to predict another 100 data points, then it's going to be really hard because the model is specifically fitted to only those 20 data points. And that's why it's effective to have more, uh, like several data points, like hundreds, if not thousands. So these are the different methods that can be used to prevent overfitting. Uh, the second machine learning algorithm used in predicting gene expression from a DNA sequence is KNN which is a clustering algorithm. What a clustering algorithm is, uh, well, actually, before I talk about clustering algorithms, I should probably define the two types of machine learning. So one, the most commonly used type is supervised training, and the other one is unsupervised training. So in supervised learning, essentially, the data set that you're given to train the model on is pre has predefined output labels. For example, in the previous example with cats and dogs, you can be given a large data set of pictures of cats and dogs, and those would be, each picture would be labeled with either cat or dog. But in unsupervised learning, it's different because you're given all those images, but you're not given the associated labeling. So you're just given the images and the model has to somehow try to predict uh, whether each image is a cat or dog, even from the, the training set. So KNN falls into the more rare category of unsupervised learning and machine learning. And essentially with this clustering algorithm, there's, uh, well, in this case, they would be given several different gene, uh, several different uh, DNA sequences. And uh, the model would have to just by the DNA sequences itself and analyzing different features within them, it would have to create a, some kind of model that kind of, uh, that kind of gives a method for predicting gene expression. So specifically for this case, the heuristic that's used in KNN is a Euclidean distance that takes the target gene and the landmark gene and does different calculations such as 
well, well, they're listed here. They're shown here at the bottom of the slide, but you can just think of them as average expression values that represent their overall value. That's going to be used in the heuristic. Okay, so further applications of uh, gene, uh, gene expression profiling would be, uh, well, oncologists who are cancer researchers, they can predict new types of cancers from a sequence of DNA. And they can use genetics and they can use the sequences of other cancers. So the sequences of other cancers would help in showing how the DNA sequences of certain types of cancer, they lead to the, the gene expression of that cancer. And that can really aid again in predicting new cancers. So another application would be the single point mutations in a human genome can be compared to other completely sequenced genomes of different animals to find any changes in gene expression. And this can actually tell us a lot about evolution in general, how different, so basically evolution, uh, well, mutations are the raw source of evolution and evolution, like with these differences uh, through the mutations, we can see basically like what different mutations lead to different phenotypical appearances. For example, uh, like why humans are not large, like they're not much taller like certain sea animals are. Uh, and different things like that. So uh, even more applications of predicting gene expression from a DNA sequence are uh, the entire human genome is extremely large and unlike certain small animals, small organisms that we've already sequenced, we have, uh, there are certain sequences that we actually do not understand in the human genome and uh, using different computational models to see what the gene expression is from different DNA sequences can help us in understanding different types of DNA sequences that have not been studied as much. And uh, yeah, a more obvious application would be that predicting gene expressions can help predict the different phenotypical appearances uh, uh, from different sets of DNA. And we can, again, also understand new mutations, which can aid us in understanding uh, biologically humans from an evolutionary standpoint. And by the way, here at, this, at the bottom of the slide, here's an example of a mutation, uh, which again, one of the applications of gene expression profiling is helping us to understand different mutations. And with UV radiation, which is an example of something that can cause a genetic mutation, uh, UV radiation can, uh, can cause like deletion of different DNA nucleotides, which you can see in the before and after picture. Okay, so uh, we just finished this application and you guys maybe have questions. So we're gonna open the floor up for some questions. All right, currently there are no additional questions. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next application of today, uh, protein folding. Okay, so we're going to start it off again with some background information about protein folding. So proteins, as you guys may have learned in your life sciences classes, they're amino acid chains that can fold up into different structures. So there's kind of uh, like a process for how proteins, they fold into these structures. Uh, they're like intermediate steps. So the first structure, uh, do we have a, okay. Uh, right, so the first structure is um, the primary structure, which is the raw DNA sequence. And that's just, again, the set of uh, all the different nucleotides in a, in a specific gene sequence. And, uh, and basically, uh, well, with this DNA sequence, this is the very start uh, of the entire process because uh, after we go through transcription and then translation, we build up the, the, the initial protein, right? So from the primary structure, we can create a secondary structure, which, so again, in this image, you can see at the top, the primary structure, just the different amino acids uh, linked together. And then in the secondary protein structure, 
There are different bondings that happen and different structures such as alpha helices and beta pleated sheets are formed from these uh, primary protein structures. And then after the secondary structure, there's even more folding and more attractions between the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. And these, form, uh, these allow for more folding of the protein, which can eventually lead to the final stage of a protein structure, coordinary protein structure, which can sometimes even be consisted of um, multiple amino acid chains or multiple proteins. So protein folding is extremely important in general because uh, what can happen in protein misfolding is that if a wrong amino acid is inserted into the polypeptide chain or different environmental factors like UV radiation, uh, they affect the DNA sequence, then that can actually affect the larger structure of the protein, like the coordinary structure, and it can cause different diseases, like common diseases like Alzheimer's. So we can, uh, so bioinformatics and computational biology can help us predict the larger structures of proteins based on several factors. Okay, so again, ju just to further explain the problem, uh, pr in folding, proteins have to, there's several, there's like a large, large number of potential conformations that they can reach. And conformations are just like final protein folding states. So the proteins have to search through an extremely large number of these uh, kinds of foldings to find their final coordinary structure. And in researching the problem, scientists have to kind of find an answer to a two-fold problem. So um, the first problem would be, what is the protein folding code? So this is essentially the... Uh, it describes, it regards the mechanisms by which uh, several factors, they work together. Some of these factors could be hydrogen bonding, for example. And uh, just to give you an example of what a folding code is like in biology, again, this is not related to the protein folding code. It's just a separate kind of code, but just uh, hopefully it can give you kind of an idea of how it works. At the bottom, you can see a picture of a genetic code, code table. And this basically, this is basically related to uh, the previous application in which uh, proteins are, are formed, right, from the raw DNA sequence. So uh, within each codon, which is a set of three DNA nucleotides, uh, or mRNA nucleotides in this case, uh, you can use this table to predict what the final um, what the final amino acid will be. So, for example, if you trace this table and the first ba uh, first codon base is a G, then we're at the bottom row of the table, and then the second codon is a the second codon base is a um, C, and then the final codon base is a anyone U C A or G you can see that it narrows down to the amino acid alanine. And uh, basically the proteins, or sorry, amino acid chain, or DNA sequences, they go through this process in determining what each amino acid will be from their respective codons. So again, that's just an example of a folding code in biology. And uh, this protein folding code is complicated by the, uh, the existence of several different factors like hydrogen bonding. So the second problem that researchers have to find a solution to is uh, finding if it's possible to predict the structure of a protein from the primary DNA sequence and how they would do that. So some computer algorithms have actually been uh, created to predict the structure of small proteins accurately, but the problem with them, the limitation of them is that they can only go up to predicting the final protein folding states of DNA sequences of up to 100 nucleotides, nucleotides long. And this is not long at all because usually nucleotides are like much, much longer than them. They can be like thousands and maybe sometimes even millions of nucleotides long. So um, yeah, that's a limitation of uh, current computer algorithms. And we're just gonna talk about the different research that's been done in this area and how uh, these computer algorithms have been continually modified. Uh, so just to reiterate on the protein folding code, uh, other examples of factors that can complicate the folding of proteins would be uh, hydrophobic interactions between amino acids, which is just 
a different type of chemical interaction between amino acids are, uh, just like hydrogen bonding is. And another factor would be chaperone proteins that regulate the folding of the proteins. And a final factor, uh, or a final example factor, would be different environmental factors such as pH and temperature, which can all play a major role in the final uh, folding state of a protein. Okay, so now uh, specifically on the different mechanisms that have been currently used to assess protein folding. Uh, there are two of them that are uh, pretty accurate. The first one is PSB plot. And by the way, these two techniques are more physics based than computational based because sometimes uh, they're like computers aren't the best way to solve problems, especially in bioinformatics. Uh, but there are, because again, AI algorithms, they can only predict, of up, uh, predict the folding structure for DNA sequences of up to 100 nucleotides. So that's why physics mechanisms are often used in this case. But an example of a physics mechanism would be a PSB plot. And essentially, this type of, uh, this type of model relies on two main trends in protein folding structure. So fast protein folders, they tend to have local structure and slow protein folders tend to have non-local structure. So an example of non-local structure would be beta pleated sheets and an example of local structure would be alpha helices. So both of these trends are used in predicting what the final uh, protein folding state uh, of these proteins are. And uh, and the plot, an example of this PSB plot is shown on the right hand side with this image here. Uh, and it's just a scatter plot. And a second mechanism that is often used for protein folding is uh, funnel shaped energy landscapes. So, uh, as you can see in the bottom picture, these are pictures of different stages of protein folding. And uh, in this case, there is actually a bit of uh, computation involved in that machine learning algorithms can be used to use these different pictures in predicting what the final outcome will be uh, using different uh, techniques such as computer vision and uh, even on machine learning like uh, convolutional neural networks. Okay, so uh, yeah, as I said before, uh, in this case, physics-based modeling is often used in these computer simulations, specifically replica exchange molecular dynamics. Uh, that's what you saw before in the previous slide. And uh, a limitation, again, of these models is that they're only effective for proteins with chains of up to around 100 DNA nucleotides. And more research is currently being done <coughs> on predicting these structures of larger proteins. Okay, so uh, some further applications of predicting protein folding are that, um, like I said before at the start of the application, many diseases can occur like Alzheimer's when a protein folds incorrectly. And uh, the protein's function, I, you guys may have learned this before, but protein sh structure and protein function, they go hand in hand and they're related uh, in, in several aspects. So a protein's function would be largely uh, related to its protein shape and like an incorrect folding could like negatively impact the protein function and this can have uh, several consequences such as Alzheimer's um, and other common diseases. So predicting these possible diseases ahead of times from original amino acid chains can help doctors uh, diagnose and prevent these diseases. So, uh, and also just in terms of further research, predicting uh, like these amino acid chains from uh, the, for protein structures can also help them understand how proteins become denatured and potentially what scientists can do to prevent that. Okay, so that is the end of the third application. Uh, if you guys have any questions, we're gonna give you like 30 seconds to ask them before we move on to the final one. All right, it seems like there's no question, so we'll move on to the last application. Okay, 
So we're going to talk about one final application for today. And this is on brain biometrics, and we're going to explain what that is in just a second. But before we go into talking about it, uh, the previous applications that we discussed were, uh, they're largely uh, involved with pure computation computational biology, but this application is an example of how computational biology can even be used in uh, instances other than research in the real world. So like corporations can use this kind of research. Okay, so the problem with, and by the way, this regards cybersecurity. So the problem with current cybersecurity is that there are, uh, well, data breaches are prevalent as a Pew Research Center from 20, survey from 2016 found that 64% of US adults have experienced major data breaches in their lifetime. And these, uh, these breaches have detrimental effects as the Identity Theft Research Center found in 2018 that the annual loss to cybercrime can go up to $445 billion. And also, uh, like cyber crime can make for hackers up to $1.5 trillion annually. So, uh, the, so the problem with current biometrics that are, and by the way, before I talk about the current biometrics, but I don't know if you guys all know what biometrics are, but they're basically like physical traits on your body that can be used for uh, authenticating yourself into a system. For example, uh, I'm sure you, many of you guys have phones. Uh, like maybe before in previous years, you'd have you'd use your fingerprint to unlock your phone, and your fingerprint could act as a, a physical biometric in that case, since uh, your fingerprint is unique to you, and you can be authenticated into the system. Another, uh, but now maybe you use your faces as facial recognition devices. But the problem is even with uh, fingerprints, facial recognition devices, iris uh, authentication, and even like voice recognition, these all have several weaknesses uh, that are inher inherent in their, um, in their design. So these primary, there are three primary weaknesses actually. The first one is regards immutability. So essentially if a, if for example, your fingerprint uh, is compromised after a hacking, like someone finds out your fingerprint, uh, or they and they use it, then you're essentially compromised forever after the hacking because you cannot change your fingerprint and your fingerprint will always serve as an authentication to whatever system you're using. So that's definitely one major problem. And in fact, in 2014, the, uh, the German defense minister had her fingerprints reverse engineered from high definition photographs. And this means that she's probably never gonna be able to use her fingerprints as an authentication system again. Uh, another weakness with biometrics is that is that they're public. So uh, these are th that means it's suscept susceptible to reverse engineering. And again, since they're public, uh, as in the previous example with the German defense minister, uh, they can they're compromised indefinitely. And a final concern with current biometrics is that they're exploitable, meaning that uh, perpetrators can often uh, they can pressure uh, authenticators to bypass a system. And this is a major issue uh, with different biometrics because for example, uh, someone could like would, could threaten you and uh, like use your fingerprint or whatever authentication system, physical authentication system you're using to get into your private information and all of your private data. So brain biometrics are uh, they're much more secure than these previous biometric systems that we were talking about because, well, first of all, brain biometrics, they utilize the unique and consistent brain waves of an individual to authenticate themselves into a system. So the way this works is basically, uh, first of all, the way with brain waves, every person's reaction to a stimulus is unique and consistent. So uh, the way that this brain, these brain waves are measured is through the use of electroencephalography tests, EEG tests, which you guys may have heard of in the past. And uh, these EEG tests, they essentially measure the, like, the voltage of your brain waves, and that's all recorded on a system software on a computer. 
So that's how you can track uh, the your brain waves and your pattern, your response to different stimuli uh, to see like uh, to create a unique authentication for an individual. And uh, these EEG tests, they measure the a metric called the auditory evoked potential AEP in a user's brain to create a unique brain signature for each user. And uh, the, by the way, so actually I'll just talk about it later, but uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So the unique value of current brain biometrics is that it kind of solves for all the, the aforementioned problems uh, from before. So for example, uh, the previous physical traits were immutable. Uh, however, uh, these brain biometric traits are private since you cannot access these brain waves without, um, unless you have specific advanced technology such as an EEG system and different techniques like that. So uh, it's much harder to obtain this data. And uh, on top of that, it's, uh, Sorry, that, that goes for publicity, my bad. Uh, so yeah, like I said before, the problem with uh, physical traits was that they're public, but these ones are private since they can't be accessed without uh, different te technology. And on immutability, uh, these can be changed because all you'd have to do is listen to a new set of stimuli, acoustical or visual stimuli, for example, and your brain waves would be different from the past. And uh, there, these traits are not exploitable because um, the unique thing about these brain biometrics is that uh, it often depends on how you're feeling when you're being authenticated. Because for example, if you're under pressure and you're nervous, it's actually your, your brain, your stimulus, or sorry, your response to different stimuli, it's altered and that can have a, a huge effect on uh, authenticating yourself. So sometimes if you're nervous, for example, or maybe even just sad, uh, you cannot be authenticated into the system. You kind of have to be like on its normal feelings. And uh, another interesting fact about brain biometrics is that a research group from Binghamton University uh, conducted a study called Cerebri. And in this study, they essentially were able to use brain biometrics to, uh, to on 500 data points to authenticate individuals with up to 100% accuracy. So uh, this shows that like, sometimes, for example, when you're, uh, when you're logging into your phone with your fingerprint, uh, you might notice that if your fingers are wet, for example, you can't log on to your phone. Uh, but with this, it always works with 100% accuracy, assuming that there's uh, like at least 400 to 500 data points. And that's a huge benefit for these, uh, these systems. So essentially uh, more on how the, the solution is for EEG testing is that uh, there's an initial EEG test with, uh, for example, acoustical stimuli, and the user would listen to a series of clicks and tones, and uh, an electro test would record these results in the form of auditory evoked potentials, uh, potentials which again is a, a metric for measuring EEG uh, software. And after this, the brain signature can be registered and the uh, using the series of clicks and tones and your response to them. And then um, in the future, if you want to ever log on to that system again, you just listen to the same series of clicks and tones. Uh, and uh, assuming that your brain waves are, uh, they're, a they're similar enough to the authenticated ones, you can be granted or denied access through a deep neural network. Okay, so the impacts of these brain biometrics is that they can be used by many corporations. For example, uh, companies with extremely private user data, such as Forbes 500 companies, banking companies, and even healthcare companies, all these people who have extremely confidential information, they can all utilize these, these softwares to prevent hacking with even up to 100% accuracy. And, a, and government agencies can also use it with their own classified data. And again, the unique part about it is that it can achieve 100% accuracy. So it's essentially impossible for a hacking to occur with these brain biometrics. And uh, these are also cost effective because even though they may cost around uh, sometimes $500, they're, it's uh, kind of a trade-off because you're, 
you're using it to get 100% authentication. And on top of that, even though some fingerprint scanners can be really cheap, again, they might not work as well, but then there are also fingerprint scanners like high accuracy ones that can cost an upward of $20,000. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it for this application. And uh, I, I'm gonna open up the floor for any other questions you have.